The Word of God says that with God, all things are possible. I really believe something amazing is going to happen in your life as we indulge in this next segment on relationships. So let's ask Heavenly Father to give us all the help that we need right now. Lord, we believe on you. We trust in you and we ask for your help. I know that the Holy Spirit is on assignment by Jesus to deliver the Word of God, the wisdom of God into the soil of our heart that we might receive fully and understand completely the Word of God. Give us insight, understanding. Unfold that Word, Lord, so that it's the treasure map to the relationships that you have intended for us. We believe we receive it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Relationships, part four, how to communicate for great relationships. How to communicate. Oh, that's such an important thing to know. You know, there was a young politician who was getting ready to make her very first campaign speech, and she was eager to make an impression. Yes, she was. But when she arrived at the auditorium, there was only one man sitting there. After waiting a while and no one else showing up, she said to the man, look, I'm just a young politician starting out. Do you think I should deliver my speech or just dismiss this meeting? The man thought for a moment, and then he said, ma'am, I'm just a rancher, and all I know is cows. Now, if I took a load of hay down on the pasture and only one cow showed up, I'd feed it. So the young politician, she felt encouraged by this, and she began her speech. She talked on and on and on and on for over two hours. The rancher sat quiet. He never moved. Finally, she finished, and she asked the rancher what he thought of her speech. Well, now, ma'am, you understand that I'm just a rancher, but I do know this. If I took a load of hay down to the pasture and only one cow showed up, I surely wouldn't dump the whole load on him. <laughs> How to communicate for great relationships. It's not about quantity, folks. It's about quality. Not about more, but about better. Effective communication. To have a great life, you must have great relationships. And so that's our review of part one, two, and three of this great series. But to have great relationships... You must know how to communicate well. An article in the Dallas Morning News reported that the average couple married 10 years or more spends only 37 minutes a week in meaningful communication. Good communication is about quality connection. Just like Fleetwood Mac's iconic song, Tell Me Sweet Little Lies, is a tribute to unhealthy connection held together with deceit and lies. A survey of counseling professionals concluded that poor communication is the number one reason couples split. We must, we must get the wisdom on this because the cost of failure is just too high. So before we go any further, I must address the elephant in the room. As we've learned so far in this series, every relationship is like a ship taking you somewhere. Some carry you forward while others pull you back. But God's plan for you is always good. It's mandatory, therefore, that you have relationships that complement God's great plans for your life, right? You cannot, you cannot allow the right relationships today to pay for the wrong relationships of your past. You can't allow it. Please allow me to briefly show you how this applies to divorce. First, say no to all condemnation. I don't want any of you condemned. If you've been divorced, been in a divorced family, don't let any condemnation raise its head. God's not angry at you or mad at you. He loves you deeply, deeply. That's number one. Secondly, marriage is God's invention. In Mark 10, verse 9, Jesus said, What God has put together, let no one separate. But we need to stop assuming that God has put every earthly marriage together. Stop that. A ceremony with God's name mentioned here and there doesn't sanction a red-hot mess. Are you tracking with me on that? And then thirdly, divorce. Yes, God hates divorce. It's because he hates broken covenant, unfaithfulness, treachery, dishonesty, and anything else that could and might hurt you. You see, the priests of the Old Testament were putting away their wives for absolutely no reason. 
And that's the context we have in Malachi 2.16 when God says he hates divorce. But even Jesus said, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart, the offender's heart. Remember, the book of Jeremiah says that God personally knows the pain of unfaithfulness and divorce. He's experienced it. Look at Jeremiah 3 verse 8. And I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel committed adultery, I, that's God talking, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. My friends, get counsel. Get counsel, please, please, please get counsel before you get married. If you're lonely, don't get married. If you're broken, don't get married. Get wisdom first. Why? Because as I told you, every relationship multiplies. It's a multiplier. Don't multiply. You're lonely and you're sad and you're mad. If you don't have a life, a job, or a direction, don't be condemned now, but don't get married. Pursue wisdom first. Get healed. Get free. Get happy. Get joy. Then let God direct you and then connect you right? Now, back to how to communicate for your relationships, because good communication is critical to our success. You may have heard the famous story of the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. Well, basically it goes like this. In ancient times, the world population was centralized, and so it spoke one language. They decided to build a city with a tower that would reach to the heavens because they didn't want to spread out and scatter. They wanted to be their own God, which is obviously the opposite of God's original design and plan, his goodness, when he gave humanity the blessing to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So all the people, they started work on this ambitious plan, this ambitious tower. The Bible records that they were united in defiance of God, as we've talked about, but they were united by three things. They were one people, one dream, speaking one language. Look at Genesis 11, verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one unified people, and they all have the same language. This is only the beginning of what they will do in rebellion against me. And now, look at what the Lord says. He says, and nothing will be impossible for them which they have imagined to do. God said absolutely nothing will be impossible to these people because they're a unified people with a unified dream, with a unified language. That means they had some serious communication going on. So what was God to do with these rebellious people? They're obviously running their relationships headlong into rocks of destruction. Prosperity destroys fools. We know that. Well, look at Genesis 11, verses 7 and 8. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, God said, so they will not understand each other. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. Stop the communication, stop the dream. Stop communication, stop production. Stop the communication, stop the relationship. Good communication is born out of wisdom and counsel. It does not come natural. It's a learned art. Babies aren't born talking. Musicians aren't born performing. They develop engineers and architects. Look, they have natural gifts, but they still must learn the discipline, the language. If you want an amazing relationship, you must learn amazing communication skills, period. So let me help you with eight. Let me give you eight communication tools to advance your relationships. You know, there's a saying that says this, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. You need more than a hammer, my friend, and more than just one tool. So here we go. Number one tool, words, obviously. And I'm not just talking any words. I'm talking good words, truthful, honest, encouraging, sincere, empathetic, not flattery, not lying. I had a great uncle that he was missing three fingers doing lumberjack work. Look, you've got to use your tools correctly. You can... Use words wrong and cut people, hurt people, do destruction. You've got to use your words correctly. And yes, the the silent treatment is communication, ladies. It's passive aggressive and it has a harvest. And I'm not just picking on ladies. I know there's men that use that passive aggressive technique also. Words are number one tool. Next to go with it is tone. 
This is the spirit of what you're saying. Philippians 4 verse 5 says, let your gentleness be made known unto all men, unto all women. Guys, use some gentleness in speaking to your wife, your kids, Mr. Boss, Mr. Manager. Don't just use the right words, but mix in the right tone, the right tonality. It's not, I love you. It's, I love you. You got to be authentic and sound authentic. It's not just enough to be authentic. You have to sound authentic. Kids don't just say yes to your mom, but express a good attitude with your tone. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. Yeah, I'll do that. Number three, touch. Appropriate touch. Did you know that babies die without touch? There was a Russian, a horrific Russian experiment years and years ago, many years ago. And they put orphans on two side, on one side of each hallway. And they had orphans over here that got the necessities, the food and the diaper change with minimal touch. But these babies over here got the food, the changes, but with lots of touch. Every baby on this side of the hallway died. All these babies thrived. We need touch. We need appropriate touch right touch, an appropriate embrace for the relationship, a good handshake, a good fist bump, a pat on the back. When Pam and I first started dating, um, me and my grandfather, we never hugged. It was just wasn't what we did. And I remember um, after introducing Pam to my grandparents, we were leaving the house and Pam said, well, you got to hug your grandfather. And I was like, um, yeah, we don't do that. And I remember the first time I hugged him, he was so awkward and I was, my face was turning red. But after that, we did it more and more because, of course, Pam insisted that we hug. And so when I would hug him, he got so that he would, even before I started leaving, he would reach out his arms like, okay, it's time to go. You got to give me a hug. And obviously, I treasure those memories because he's gone now. But thank God for an appropriate touch. It communicates. Your eyes, number four, your eyes speak. They communicate. Eye contact speaks volume. Give people your attention. Listen with your eyes and stop glancing at your phone and at the TV and other distractions. Focus, communicate with your eyes. Light your eyes up when your son's talking about something he's accomplished or maybe even let your eyes look kind of sad when they're talking about challenges. Empathize with them with your eyes. And also check out your wife or your spouse when they walk in the room. Look her up and down. Look at her deeply. And don't ever be checking out some other woman. Job 31 verse 1 says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look on another woman. You've got to guard your eyes and you got to save them for the right communication. Number five, expression, your countenance. The Bible even talks about having a good countenance when you come into God's presence. Lift up a smile. Come on, get your smile on. Pam has helped me learn to manage my facial expressions to a great degree. Look, she, she's taught me how to wake it up and look happy. I used to sit in the front row when we were out doing special engagements and we were doing conferences and I would sit in the front row intently looking at another speaker and just enjoying what he's speaking. But I would have this really serious, kind of almost intense, um, mean looking gaze, but it just meant I was enjoying what I was hearing and receiving, but it would be like this. <laughs> and Pam would kind of slap me in the leg and she would say afterwards, honey, you got to change the look on your face. Make it look happy. The people on the stage, they don't understand that you don't look, you're not happy with them. Look happy. So change your expression, adjust it, and don't ever say, well, that's just not the way our family is. You're part of the family of God right now. So get with the program, right? Smile, look approving. Your expression communicates. Don't be staring off into the unknown with a blank look. Don't roll your eyes, but make them kind. And number six, Questions, requests. This is a great tool. Learn how to use thoughtful and properly placed questions. This will express interest, humility, and a willingness to engage. Good protégés ask great questions. And number seven, listening. Woo. The art of listening shows respect. It builds relationship. There's power in listening. Quit being so in love with your own opinion, your own voice. Don't listen with the intent to reply, but to understand. David J. Schwartz once said this, big people monopolize the listening. Small people monopolize the talking. Do you want to communicate great? Start listening. And then number eight, this is a great tool. You're going to like this. Pictures. 
images. It's called visual literacy. Some people are predominantly visual learners. They miss what you're saying with their, if there's too much talk. There was a wife who felt forgotten, overworked, and no matter how many times she told her husband, he just didn't seem to get it. So it made her feel neglected, hurt, uncared for. Finally, one day, as she was scrubbing and feeling just totally exhausted, she lifted up the torn rag, the dirty rag that she was using. She said to him, do you see this rag? This is how I feel. I feel worn out, torn, used up, and just worthless. The man's jaw dropped. He walked over and he put his hand on her and he said, I'm so sorry you feel like this. What can I do to help you? How can I fix this for you? Everything changed with an effective picture, the right communication. The visual cortex is the largest system of the brain. Reading is a skill we must learn, whereas picture processing is an ability we're all born with, and the language of pictures is universal. You've heard the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's true. People remember 10% of what they hear, 20% of what they read, 80% of what they see and do. And did you know 93% of communication is nonverbal? When I took Pam out on our first date, I went to the house to pick her up. We met at the door and then we walked to the car. And I got in the driver's side. I just got sat down in the driver's side. I looked over and she was still standing outside the passenger door. Nobody taught me to open the car door for the girl. But in that one effective act of communication, Pam schooled me on opening the car door for her. Not one word was spoken except afterwards she said, thank you. That reminds me of two priceless gems essential to elevated communication, respect and trust. Two priceless gems, respect and trust. Respect. It's a prerequisite for good relationship. It comes from a Latin word that means to look back or delay entrance. When you respect someone, you delay your entrance for the sake of them going first. What you respect comes to you. What you fail to respect moves away from you. Parents, if you lose your child's respect, you lose access. Oh, they may be in the same room, but your ships are going in opposite directions. Then trust. Good relationships must develop trust. Trust is not a gift, and if it is, it's misplaced. Trust is the bridge that must be built for any good relationship, and that is a process. Parents love their kids, but they don't trust their nine-year-old with a car. That would be misplaced trust. All communication must correlate with the weight load of your trust bridge. If you haven't developed a strong trust bridge with your child and you try to transfer heavy wisdom, the words will feel offensive, adversarial even, and it will damage the fragile state of your relationship. To assume access where a trust bridge has not been built is both arrogant and it's disrespectful. Access will be terminated. A dangerous counterfeit to bridge building is flattery. Flattery and false praise are highly toxic forms of manipulation and communication that undermine the integrity of any relationship. This is called biblically wicked communication. Dale Carnegie said this, flattery is telling the other person precisely what he thinks about himself. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Napoleon Bonaparte, the great general, he said this, he who knows how to flatter also knows how to slander. Oh, that's true. Proverbs says, guard your heart. Needy people are very susceptible to the poison of flattery. You cannot truly influence a person's life for good until you get close to their heart, but beware of verbal bribery and manipulation. Covert communication is a tool often used by insecure, controlling people so they can gain leverage for more manipulation. That's very dangerous. Bad seed and very dangerous. Anne Frank, who bravely documented her days hiding from the Nazis during World War II, she said this, dead people receive more flowers than the living ones because regret is stronger than gratitude. But there is a communication far stronger than regret, far stronger than flattery. You may not know this, but every person has a built-in God protocol for access. 
Genesis 1.27 says that you and I were created in God's image. We come from a God-type design. Therefore, knowing God helps you understand yourself and others better. Now listen to this, Psalm 100, verse 4. This is protocol for coming into God's presence. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into God's courts with praise. You see, this is protocol for access to God's presence. That means you have a protocol for access. You do. That means you have a protocol for access to you, your spouse, your kids, access to your brother, your sister, your neighbor. Every human has a protocol for access. If you want to come into another person's gates, use genuine thanksgiving. If you want to go deeper in, into a deeper place of a person's heart, it requires a form of authentic praise. Yes, that means to be honestly adding value to the other person using the tools of communication. Because the opposite of praise is criticism. And that employs the law of disintegration. Most things in this universe tend to move from order to disorder. The principle is called the law of disintegration. For example, your car starts deteriorating the day you drive it off the showroom floor, right? James Dobson said this about that. He said, human relationships also conform to this principle. There has to be an intentional effort to pull together and forward. That means if disintegration is the natural order, then cohesion or unity would be a choice. Using that principle on communication, we could say criticism comes natural, but encouragement, it must be a choice. I guess that's why Zig Ziglar, the famous author and motivational speaker, once said, don't be distracted by criticism. Remember, the only taste of success some people have is when they take a bite out of you. <laughs> that's good. Oh, isn't that the truth? Some people think their ministry is to try to humble those that they envy. So the law of disintegration tells us weak and failed communication is natural. It's the norm. Good communication, however, must be pursued. You've got to search out wisdom. Imagine that. Proverbs 6, verses 2 through 5. Listen to this. You are snared by the words of your mouth. Verse 3, so do this and deliver yourself. Go and humble yourself. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself. The same mouth that can communicate words that trap you can be the same mouth that communicates humility and apology, reconciliation, and deliverance from the snare. Praise God. Forgiveness restores order, honor, but forgiveness must be communicated. Good communication promotes order. Proverbs 20, verse 18, plans are established by good counsel or good order. Good communication requires timing and environment. There's a right time to say the right thing. Too much communication in this world lacks context. Not good. Jesus said this in John 16, verse 12, when he's talking to his disciples, he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Just because it's true doesn't mean your audience can handle it or is ready for it. Environment is an investment of time, thought, sometimes money, effort, but it's worth it. Don't toss your seed on the ground that hasn't been tilled. Then cry because you have no harvest. Preparation communicates respect, value for the other person, and value for your seed. Context is the canvas for the brushstrokes of your conversation. Can I say that again? Context is the canvas for the brushstrokes of your conversation. So be intentional about investing in your timing and your environment. Expert communication includes the art of conflict resolution. Disagreements and tensions, they can be part of the process arriving at excellent communication. Everyone needs help. Only successful people get help. Successful people are learners. They never stop learning. Communication, my friend, is an art. Disagreements aren't a problem unless you refuse to be proactive in communication. When you default to being reactive or passive aggressive, now that's choosing to be a failure. Pam and I were doing a week straight of national television and every day we were on this telethon for hours. It was quite exhausting because you're always on and activated. After midnight going up on the elevator to our hotel room, I made the terrible mistake of critiquing one of Pam's performances and telling her to fix this and to fix that. This is after midnight. 
Well, she was so tired and not in the mood for my helpful tips that I was communicating, and she blurted out, oh yeah? She said, well, when you pray, you say Lord too much. <laughs> we, we laughed ourselves silly that night. It was awesome, and we still think about it and laugh. Be aware of your communication style. What's effective in a business negotiation could be destructive in a family talk. Engage with understanding and a quickness to listen, not being dogmatic or stubborn, but rather think process, the word process. James 1 verse 19 says, be quick to hear, slow to speak. There's nothing wrong with speaking, but be quick to hear, slow to speak. Problems need to be addressed, but harsh words, accusations, criticism, they'll only close the gates to a person's heart shut down any possibility of a resolution. Work to build the trust bridge. Ephesians 4 verse 26 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. That exempts us from all possibility of passive aggressive, silent treatment even. That requires good communication. Not accusation, but communication. The best time to do the right thing is today, right now. Tomorrow, it will be just that much harder. The secret of how to communicate is why you communicate. Understand the goal. There's power to multiply with every relationship. That's what we've been learning. So be intentional about what you, what it is you multiply. Good communication is essential. Otherwise, your relationships end up on the rocks of life. You're going someplace. Every ship is moving someplace. Good communication steers and helps promote agreement, but agreement is not sameness. Biblical agreement is the harmony of thought, action, both in spirit and reality. Jesus said this in Matthew 18, 19. He said, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That's powerful agreement based on communication, but that word agree comes from the Greek word to harmonize. So with some trusted friends, I want you to go over again the story in Genesis 11 that we read. Again, go over it fully, read it, discuss it, and be reminded of the principle that we learned in that story of one people, one dream, one language. And get some harmony going in your small group. There is hope. Call on God because there is hope. The ultimate communication in the universe is with God Almighty. We can talk to Him. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, God says, I'll hear, I'll answer. Psalm 51, verse 17, God said, a broken and a contrite heart that I will not despise. God wants to answer us. We all need the Savior. The ultimate communication is a prayer of humility, saying, God, I need you. We need you. Save us. Help us, God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we understand that there is spiritual protocol for coming into your presence. Right now, we come before you with thankful hearts. Yes, we're so thankful for your truth and amazing grace in our lives. Help. You help us when no one else can. God, we praise you for the blessing of Jesus' work on the cross. You perfectly communicate your love, your forgiveness, and your unfailing mercy for us. Now we ask for more wisdom so that we can learn to communicate with one another, pleasing so that it's pleasing to you. God, we desire to honor you, and that means we want to communicate mercy, kindness, and forgiveness to one another. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your instructions on living, loving, and doing good, living strong. We are the blessed family of God, all in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.